All right, according to Apple time, it is right at <laughs> noon Eastern time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we can consider that official time, don't you think, Joe? I do, yes. <laughs> Although right. I'll tell you, sometimes my iPhone and my computer have two different times. I don't understand it, but let's trust it. <laughs> Who knows how that works? That's all right. <laughs> Listen, we're so excited that everybody has joined us, and we're really excited that, that uh, Joe McGuire has joined us from Indasa. Uh, just a brief background on Indasa, a little bit of plug for their organization. Uh, they are, they're actually an organization that companies like ArcPoint Labs uh, that specialize in drug and alcohol testing, lean into to support our industry. Uh, I went ahead and grabbed their mission statement, and, and we threw it into a slide here today because we think it's really important for everybody on the call to understand that their job is to advocate for a safe and drug-free workplace. They do a lot of lobbying in Washington and, and, and helping to ensure that it's easy for companies to implement testing protocols and and make sure that, that it's it's valuable to everybody that that needs to take place in this. We really understand that there's a huge epidemic um, across the country right now, so it's obviously a hot topic. The random programs have increased for Department of Transportation for this year because of the percentage of positives. And so this is very, very much a hot topic. But uh, Joe and her organization are there in order to let me try to see who's talking real quick and we're going to try to mute everybody there we go so we're uh we're really excited that joe has decided to join us she has a conference that she's running next week so it's not lost on me that this is a a big kind of outside the box thing for her but she's a speaker a writer for safe uh, and drug-free workplaces for families and communities not just in the workplace uh, but she's going to be spending most of the time talking so Joe I'm going to actually pass it over to you well thank you so much John and thanks to ArcPoint for having me present today and um, this is what we're going to cover before I kind of get into the why of the clearinghouse we're just going to briefly kind of cover the clearinghouse final rule, but more why is it necessary? And then the timeline of it, um, who is required to use it, which obviously if you're on the call, you're required. So we'll just kind of get into that a little bit. Then we're going to spend most of our time on the user registration and all of the parameters around the clearinghouse. Um, and then we'll do frequently asked questions. So um, yeah, it's fine to go to the next slide. That's fine. Uh, so we had this final rule in um, 2016. It was mandated by Congress. Um, so, you know, it's been in play for a long time, and some people are surprised to see that date. 2016, how come I'm just now hearing about it? Um, well, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one, of the, one of the big things that um, we have found that federal motor carriers is, is a bit frustrated with is, you know, it's not that easy just to do mass communication with the millions and millions of people who participate in the federal motor carriers program. And even though they have um, sent this notice out, I mean, we've sat down with federal motor carriers and they've said, you know, we've sent this email out, you know, they've documented like 50 times or something. And then we go, how many of those bounced back? And they're like, you know, most of them, <laughs> you know, like 90% bounce back, right? People, you know, companies change their email addresses or they have spam filters or, uh, you know, employees come and go. And so you have someone who's overseeing the drug testing program and that person changes out um, every couple of years. And so it's been frustrating to get this mass communication. And so one of the things that we've run into is people who literally have no idea about this. So I'm grateful for those of you who are on the webinar today because you've heard um, you've heard about it. And one thing I would encourage you to do is tell your um, associates and make sure that, that they are also engaging. So the why, let's, let's talk about this. Um, why, you know, I, I've seen complaints on social media of uh, drivers. I, I have a lot of um, friends and family who are uh, uh, owner operators and they see this as the government kind of stepping on their neck you know why are they adding more things for us to do well it's quite simple 
First of all, 49 part 40 has a requirement that when a driver fails a drug or alcohol test, they are to be evaluated by a substance abuse professional who will then determine, do they have a problem? Um, does this person, you know, need to, to talk to someone about this and, and correct this? Or have they just done something stupid and need to be re-educated and reminded of the rules? And this is, this is really valuable because what we have seen is, first of all, the goal overall, keep roads safe. Keep roads safe, keep roads safe. Keep transportation safe and, and think about the potential victims, whether that's the driver um, himself or herself or the general public. We want to avoid catastrophes here. And, and so it's all about protecting people. But ultimately, employers are supposed to um, report violations for future uh, employers and for past past employers are supposed to report violations for future employers. So maybe you have an owner operator who takes contracts with a variety of trucking companies. And if the, in the past, a, an owner operator could have multiple violations. And uh, if a, if a company they were currently working for didn't keep track of the records, maybe they didn't know. Um, it, then a future employer is supposed to, according to the rules, get previous drug history results and say, you know, is this a driver in the middle of a treatment plan? Have they done a clean return to duty test? And if that, it, you know, we've had no central repository for that information, people can slip through the cracks. You could unknowingly hire an owner operator or just even uh, someone in your employee who's had a violation or several violations. And, and so this is a way of putting out a net to kind of catch that and, and make sure that we're eliminating people who slip through the cracks and, and um, protecting safety. So it's due diligence. So we have the final rule, 2016. Uh, registration began in fall of 2019. And then the, the clearinghouse went live January 6th of this year. So now we're looking at two months uh, um, that we've had this open and available. And then the three-year mark is important because in 2023, uh, we'll no longer, we should no longer have to manually put data in. It should uh, go ahead and, and automatically update that data after that point. Now, that is something that is tentative because we got to see how this goes. As some of you may already know, there have been some frustrations with um, getting in, getting registered, um, because it's been very overwhelming for the system to bear all of that data. It's been very stressed. Um, you know, we've had some massive companies going in and trying to upload 10,000 employees. And so it shut the system down. And so we had people who are like, I'm getting up at two o'clock in the morning and trying to enter my drivers and it's taking me four hours. That, that has happened. Um, so we're not going to apologize on behalf of federal motor carriers, but we are going to say we got to have patience. I think it's more smoothly operating now, but one of the other pieces for the 2023 benchmark here that we're looking at is uh, that, that local state, I should say, state um, driver's license bureaus or Department of Motor Vehicles, whatever it's uh, titled in your state, um, they are required um, to, to have an interface with this database for anybody who is a CDL driver. Well, we already know that that has had to be extended because um, all of the state interfaces don't line up and automatically transfer. And so we had to have that extension. So we'll see how this goes with all the technical difficulties. But right now we're hoping that this stays on pace because if we hit that three-year benchmark, it will be easier for all of us. So, yeah, Joe, um, let me, let me add and, something real quick, but, if you don't yeah, mind. I think, um, no, go ahead. you know, from, from the arc point perspective, as a, as a national network of sort of industry experts that are out there, in the field every day talking to businesses, they're feeling exactly what it is that you're stating. Their customers mm -hmm. and, and people that, that know who we are that lean into us for expertise, they, they're coming to us and saying, 
yeah, it's not working very well. And so I, I think what I mm -hmm. hear you say is, is that really, one, just, just have a little bit of comfort in the fact that you're not alone. Uh, at this point, yes. anything new like this in any industry is going to cause complexities and confusion. And so if you're confused, recognize that, that you're not alone. There's a lot of confusion out there. We're going to continue to host these types of educational forums to help clear up that confusion. You can lean mm -hmm. into your local Arc Point Labs for the support if you feel like you need it. We'll help you identify the best way to do that at the end of the webinar. But mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that we have the, the options to fix it, but we do have somewhat of a voice with the people. So we can continue to get your feedback and push it over to the FMCSA, work with organizations like Endasa that also have a voice so that we can make it better in the future. So don't hesitate to lean into us uh, when you need to in order to, to help navigate this a little bit. Well, exactly. I think you really nailed that, John. When I field calls of people who are extremely frustrated, um, and when when they hear, I mean, everybody's experiencing what you're experiencing. It's not just you. You know, I, I get it because I do this to myself. I'm sitting at my computer and something's not working and I don't realize that the whole site has crashed and I'm tearing my hair out. And it helps when I figure out, oh, the site's crashed. It's not just I, I'm not understanding what to do here. So, yes, you are not alone is the big thing. And then one of the things that we continue to do um, with our Drug and Alcohol Screening Association, we are setting up regional trainings with federal motor carriers and, and having them just present this information over and over and over again at these local events. And why I mentioned that, I mean, if I were you, your Arc Point is your expert stick with Arc Point. But the reason I mentioned these events is because we get the opportunity to watch the federal motor carrier experts um, who are running this program, hear the real-time concerns of people on the ground using this, and it's, it's helping them understand what the problems are. Because as we have sat down with federal motor carriers and said, okay, explain this to us and help us communicate this for the, the end user in, in a better way, or, hey, we're having this issue. Um, they have all the answers. I mean, they're, they've thought it all through. They have all the answers. They can answer every single scenario um, uh, theoretically. But then when we get on the ground and they're listening to the end users, I can't tell you how much it's helping them to go, oh, we didn't know that was a problem. We will get to work on fixing that right now. So this will continue to evolve is the message. Um, it will continue to evolve. We'll continue to troubleshoot. So John also said something very important that I want to reiterate with you, and that is um, we have access to email these folks and to call them up and say, hey, this isn't working the way that it's supposed to. We need a fix for this. And so let our point be your conduit for that um, because we definitely have a voice with them and some influence there to, to work out kinks as they come up. So at the end of the day, this is real-time access to reported violation information for authorized users. This is a good thing. It's a positive. Um, it's just a central database repository. There are secure measures in place to protect this data, which we're going to talk about. Um, it does make it so much easier for employers to meet pre-employment investigations and, to re and for your reporting obligations. I cannot tell you how many times I have I have heard employers in my over decade of being in this industry say, I had no idea this was my obligation. I did not know. And now they're in an audit and getting fined for a violation. So this will help ease that burden, okay? Also, it's more difficult for drivers who are bad actors to conceal drug and alcohol violations. You know, we know the majority of the time that's not the case, but we also do know it does happen. And even if it's the the minority um, of times, you know, the, the um, exception to the rule, this is the, the person that's going to cause the tragedy on our roadways. So, uh, and then gives us greater insight into employer compliance with drug and alcohol testing rules. Um, and, and again, keep referring back to, you know, John's blurb there was just so gold. Um, FMCSA looks at the data and looks to see what's trending and what they need to do to protect 
uh, safety. So it does, it will help change and evolve the rules as we go, all for safer roadways. So uh, who are the participants? Well, the drivers themselves, um, CDL drivers. Now, uh, there's more responsibility on an owner operator uh, typically than on the driver that's employed by a large company. So uh, usually employers that are that are uh, are drivers that are employed by a company, that employer usually takes on the responsibility of handling this stuff. Owner operators, um, you've got to be able to get into this thing and assign yourself a TPA, uh, which is our point. So. <clears throat> I've gotten a lot of calls from CDL drivers over the, the, the last couple of weeks who say, I was with a TPA in a random pool. I have no idea who it was. Can you help me? Um, they can't find an email. They can't find a communication. Um, they're really struggling. So if you contract out with owner operators, please send them a reminder to help them. They want to be compliant. They're just feeling a little lost. Um, if, if you are that person, again, lean on our point. Um, but then if you employ CDL drivers as the employer, obviously this applies to you. It also applies to the consortia um, third party administrator. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. The medical review officer is going to be in this database and is going to report specific violations. Um, the substance abuse professional. Uh, so when, so the, the roles here are that when a driver has a violation and they are to be evaluated by a substance abuse professional whom they choose, that substance abuse professional is to put the uh, results of the follow-up test and the um, evaluation into the database, okay? And then obviously, as I mentioned, the state driver's license agencies um, are, are to also put the CDL numbers in and, and this is all to be coordinated. Why? So that um, I've seen one case of this. I saw one driver several years ago who failed a drug and alcohol test, had a very serious violation and just skipped out of my state and went to the next state up the chain north of here and uh, got a new CDL. And um, obviously that's a horrendous violation. Um, so this way, when we, we have all the driver's license agencies talking to each other. We can avoid those those egregious violations as well. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. This is just the link to register. Clearinghouse.fmcsa, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, .dot .gov backslash register. Um, again, uh, I, I have I, like my statement is it's easier than it looks, but then because we're having some technical difficulties, I don't want to oversimplify, but just go in and, and follow the steps. And um, John, let me ask you, if someone is struggling, will their uh, specific ARC point um, contact help them register? Will you do that as a TPA? It's Location by location, but yes, in most cases, okay. we have the ability to go in and, and help them register. Great. So, yeah, so depending on um, on your location, but again, um, we're always available and here for you uh, to answer those questions. And we put this Let's website go. into uh, the chat window as well, so it's an easy link okay. at the end of the webinar for you to go in and click on. Great, click and go. <laughs> Good deal. Um, I, and, and one thing, uh, I'm going to mention this a little bit later, but please don't wait until you have a violation to register. You want to get your drivers registered now, and, and that will become clear to you of why that's important. Um, I, listen, I would, at the end of this presentation, just click on the link and go through it. And, and so we'll talk about how to make that easier for you. So authorized users in the day, oh, go back. Authorized users in the database um, are the drivers, um, the employers, this includes um, motor carriers and other employers of drivers operating commercial motor vehicles that require a CDL or a learner's permit. Um, so this is so important. Uh, one of the things that I've seen come up in the Q&A at our, at our live events with federal motor carriers is people are not realizing that the commercial learners permit drivers should be entered in there and they absolutely should, especially because you typically do the pre-employment drug screen test, okay? 
of course, your consortia third-party administrators, um, they're going to help uh, with some of this data, which we'll see in a moment. And then we already mentioned the other three. So uh, we, we could have enforcement personnel as well. So let's go on. All right. This slide is really about the rules um, or the roles, uh, the roles and responsibilities. Now, if this is a little blurry for you, if, it, if you have a small screen, this is a screenshot of information that's right on the Clearinghouse uh, website. So if you look at the bottom, clearinghouse.fmcsa.dot.gov, so much helpful information there. Um, one of the things I'll say to everybody listening on the call, and I'm just going to kind of slow down so you can hear me say this. We're all busy. All of us are busy. This day is just jam packed and I know you're going to be running until quitting time and some of you beyond then. But do take the time to just click on the link, go through and read it. I mean, block off some time of do not disturb um, and, and read through. The information is helpful and most of it is really simple to understand, but you got to take the time. And I am saying that as someone who I move fast, I'm a big personality and I leave the details to someone else. And I, I want to hand it to me really quickly, like on this webinar, and then I'm going to go and move from there. But um, I do want to say I, I have had to, so I'm going to first in line, slow down, read the information. Okay. So your role, I want to go through this for a moment now. The driver needs to register as a user, and that's already open and operated. The driver also needs to consent to full query request. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit and explain that in detail. And then if the driver has a violation, they need to select a substance abuse professional, okay, but only if they have a violation. So that's not something they do beforehand. Now. As the employer, you have the biggest role and responsibility here. So let's go through this. You need to register your drivers. Again, I, I highly encourage you to do that today. Um, you need to manage any assistance that you have. So when you go in and you create your profile, um, you as the, we call in the industry, the language is typically DER, Designated Employer Representative. Um, if you don't know that term, that's usually the person in a company that manages the drug and alcohol testing program. I, I'm going to bet highly that if you're on this call, you're probably the DER. Um, and, and a lot of you have a, a secondary person in the office who's going to help you manage that. You need to assign them that role, okay? So one person logs in, sets up the account, and assigns, uh, manages any assistance. Um, you're going to select your TPA, okay? Um, now, here's one that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here for just a second. Your TPA should auto-populate in this system, but I have heard of a difficulty. It's a technical glitch where you can't find your TPA. They're not showing up, and so people have just been selecting another one that pops up. That's not good. Don't select someone that is not your TPA because what happens is you end up transferring all of your random pool data to someone who is now calling you and saying, well, you just gave me all these permissions and I need your uh, employee list and we need to start running your random pool. That's not how you want to do this. You're going to create a big headache for yourself. So if your ArcPoint TPA doesn't show up, don't panic. Stop the process call them up and say, you're not showing up in the system. We need you to get a hold of federal motor carriers and find out why you're not showing up so that, so that they show up and populate in the database. You can't make them show up. They need to take care of that. So that is a headache people are having, but please don't select someone that's not your TPA. John, do you have anything to add there that would bring clarity to that one piece? No, I think that I think that you did a good job clearing it up, and and it's just important for you to get in and educate yourself on what your specific role is and what it is that you mm -hmm. need to take care of. And 
And I think there's a lot of information inside of here that we could go into details on. We have a lot of different roles on the call. And mm -hmm. as I'm looking at mm -hmm. the, the, the chat messenger here, lots of specific questions on different uh, different areas. We have everybody from TPAs on here to owner operators to employers. And so I think what we can do is get to specific questions at the end and we can also we be in the be in the field with you to answer your specific questions after the call as well. But yes, let's, and let's we can I, yeah, I'm I hopefully I'll answer a lot of your questions as we go, but if not we'll have time at the end. So um, I'm just going slow on a couple of these that I know have been sticky and then we'll keep going. All right. So which drivers are covered? Any driver who holds a CDL and as I mentioned the learner's permit if they're covered under um, 49 part 383 and part 382. Now, it is very important that for limited, um, uh, I'm sorry, for full queries, a query just means in this uh, lingo that we're using, query is a search, okay? Um, that you have uh, electronic consent. So you need um, a release signed by your driver. It could be electronic or it could be a wet signature. Um, that you you also must have for a full query. You must have that that consent for the driver, um, and then a driver must review their own clearinghouse record and initiate the process to revise and or remove incorrectly entered information. That's up to the driver. Okay, and then um, the, again, they must identify the the substance abuse professional if they need a return to duty process, as we've already mentioned. So we can continue to go on. All right, so um, what is an owner operator? Any employer who employs himself or herself uh, as a CDL driver. So I think those of you on the call pretty much know that. So um, again, they must select a CTPA and that's mostly to make sure that they're in the random pool. Okay, let's continue. All right, so owner operators, they are to verify that their information is correct, um, designate the CTPA, Again, uh, some I, I've talked to uh, several in the last few weeks that maybe the, um, their wife manages or uh, you know someone else helps manage that stuff while they're out on the road. So you need to designate if there's someone else in there and then um, select and purchase a query plan. Your TPA cannot do that on your behalf. The owner operator or the employer um, needs to select and purchase a query plan. Let's, we'll, we'll talk about that again later. Let's go on. Okay, so um, the CTPA role, report drug and alcohol violations. And where this, uh, we'll, we'll have a list at the end of what these violations look like, um, but mostly this is a refusal to test is where the CTPA comes in. Um, negative return to duty results and follow-up testing. So um, just to clarify uh, for anyone who the language, you know, may be a little bit foreign to you, someone has a drug or alcohol violation, they must um, have a return to duty, a clean return to duty test uh, before they can continue safety sensitive duties. So the way the rules work, they need to be evaluated. Any violation, failed drug or alcohol test must be evaluated by a substance abuse professional to determine do they have a problem? Did they make you know, a dumb mistake? And then the substance abuse professional will determine if they need treatment or they need education. Regardless of what that looks like, they need to have a return to duty test um, at, at some point before they can return to safety sensitive duties. Now, I, I'm gonna stress this again because this is such an important reason for the database existing, the clearinghouse. If your company policy says you're firing them, they're out of here, we're done, you walk. I get that your policy can say that and you can enforce it. However, you must still give that driver um, information on, uh, on having an evaluation by a substance abuse professional and they still must seek out that substance abuse professional, have that evaluation and then um, go through the process that the, the substance abuse professional outlined and have a clean return to duty test before they can be employed by another uh, company, and that's where the clearinghouse comes in. So, substance abuse professional is going to have to be in there 
and, and make sure we know they've had a negative return to duty test. And then maybe if they're in a treatment program, that SAP, uh, substance abuse professional, will outline a series of follow-up tests. Um, kind of like random testing, only it's mandatory follow-up. It's mandatory uh, under direct observation as our return to duty test. Um, though that, those series of tests need to be in the database so that we can see that driver has followed the plan, they successfully completed it, they've done everything they're supposed to, and now um, they can operate. So the CTPA can also conduct queries to check out this information. And then, um, again, all these queries are manual until 2023, January 6, 2023. Let's go on. Hey, Joe, on the TPA question, we do have a lot of TPAs that are on this call. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not listed as the CTPA, what do you have to do? Is the only way to update it or report into it is to be the CTPA, or are there other ways that you can get that done? So. First, you know, go through the, the steps um, like ABC. A, go register, log in, um, create your profile, make sure that's all in there. Give it 24 to 48 hours. Um, check and see if you show up. If, if you're not showing up as an option, then um, email Federal Motor Carriers. I think we've included their info at email address in here. You can even call them. Um, usually it populates within 24 to 48 hours, um, and, and it's not a problem. But I just, I've, I've heard of a few cases where they're, you know, like it's 30 days later and they're still not showing up. That's not okay. We got to get them in there. So I would, and I wouldn't, I mean, in my opinion, 24 to 48 hours, I'd be calling federal motor carriers or emailing them and saying, I've got a problem and we, we got to get this resolved. Um, don't, and, let and it, don't let it. They're backlogged. They're just having patient. They're backlogged. Yeah. Follow up and, and exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So frequently asked questions: How are employers and third-party administrators required to use the clearinghouse? Okay. So we've already talked about the centralized database, um, drug and alcohol program violations, and to check that current or prospective employees are not prohibited from performing safety-sensitive functions. This is why you're querying. You're looking in there to see, is there a violation that would prevent them from operating a CMV um, due to unresolved drug and alcohol program violations, all right? So if they have not completed the return to duty process. And I think this is probably one of the most confusing pieces for people, and yet really it's the simplest explanation so this is where, again, slow down and understand we're doing a limited query to see if they have a violation that is unresolved. And, and one thing that we need to be careful of is if they have a violation that is resolved, they've gone through the process and they're cleared for safety sensitive duties, that's a viable candidate, okay? They're looking for unresolved. And then they need to be encouraged to go through the process to get it resolved, okay? Um, so to complete these actions, employers and CTPAs, again, must register. All right, so let's talk about the registration process. Okay, so before you can conduct the query, um, you, you have to have this, um, this registration in the database, <clears throat> um, and you either have an account in the portal or you don't and and so there's two different uh, sets of criteria for you but you just go in you follow the steps um, it's pretty intuitive and if you already have a portal account everything auto populates if you do not then you simply put all that information in there your company if you're required to participate you should have a usdot number that that creates the auto population. If you don't, you need to request that prior to registering for the clearinghouse. I'm assuming that those that are on the call, you already have this, you know what you're supposed to be doing. If maybe you're very new to this industry or a new owner operator and you haven't gone through that process, go to the FMCSA website and start that process. Let's go to the next one. 
Okay, so this just reiterates in a, a little simpler format. Um, if you have your USDOT number, you have your portal account, you enter your credentials that it requests, link to your company, and then it'll all link to your clearinghouse account. You designate your CTPA, you agree to the terms and conditions, you move on, okay? If you don't have your FMCSA portal account, USDOT number, you enter your contact information and your company information manually, designate your CTPA, agree to the terms and conditions. So hopefully you all already have your portal credentials and this will be simple and easy for you. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so um, this is a screenshot of the Clearinghouse registration page and it's create a login um, .gov account, how to access it, um, you know, probably this is, this is the place where people have a tendency to get um, hung up a little bit. And so one of the things that um, we want to mention is you do have to do a two-step um, authentication for security. So um, make sure that you have, you, the best way to do this is to have two phone numbers. So whether that is your, your personal cell phone and the landline, um, it will contact you on both of those um, uh, mechanisms, whichever you enter to verify that it's correct. So if it's a landline, you're gonna get a phone call. If it's your cell phone, you can opt into a text message and you do need to respond with that verification so that you can get the two-step authentication. And that's a security method which we all want and, and want to have in there, right? So uh, make sure it tells you right on the front page what all you need to be ready to go in and it walks you through step-by-step. Step. Go to the next one. All right, so um, again, I mentioned you'll be asked about your portal credentials, um, CTPA, et cetera. Uh, they, it also, the drivers will enter, if a driver goes in, they'll enter their CDL information. So now if you are an employer or a TPA and you're helping people get it entered, you've got to have that CDL information, okay? Um, that's going to matter and we'll have another little graphic here that shows you, but um, MROs and SAPs, I don't know if we have any of them on the call, but they'll have to certify that they meet the Part 40 requirements. So again, you have a little progress chart here on getting um, all uh, logged in and authenticated, and you just click through and go step by step. Let's go to the next one. All right, then you have a user dashboard. This is your home page for whatever role you are in this database. Um, again, you can invite and manage assistance. So I mentioned it for owner operators, but since we do have TPAs on the call, um, if you have someone who is um, helping you to manage this, you need to invite them and create their role and manage them. And then they need to also go in and register, okay? Everybody who has their fingers in this needs to go in and be registered so that they have their own login credentials. Do not use each other's login credentials. That's something very frowned upon. This is, we wanna make sure we protect security around this information, okay? Um, so everybody needs to make sure you have your own login credentials. And then the um, owner operator or the employer, and I think primarily this will be the employer will purchase query plans. The TPA cannot do this. This is a role where the Federal Motor Carriers has really locked this down and said TPAs will not do this on behalf of the employer. This is upon the employer. So I'll have a little chart here in a minute that will show you what those look like. Um, and then it's upon everybody. Your responsibility is to report any drug and alcohol program violations as of January 1st, and then also to conduct queries. So um, let's, let's see, let's go to the next slide. I think we're going to get a little bit more into queries here coming up. Okay. Um, well, first of all, let's do this. This one is important and then we'll move on to a little bit more about queries. Who qualifies? Interstate and interstate motor carriers, including passenger carriers. Okay. With the CDL. Um, 
okay, school bus drivers, construction equipment operators, those that, that FMCSA drug testing will apply to, and that you know that goes by weight. Limousine drivers goes by passenger. Municipal vehicle drivers like waste management vehicles, uh, federal and other organizations that employ drivers subject to the drug and alcohol rules, including Department of Defense municipality school districts. Let's go on. All right. Um, so again, central database uh, report violations. So here's where we get into queries. Um, if you are to do a full query as part of each pre-employment driver investigation process, okay, that's required full query. Now you can do limited queries. Um, you are you're actually required to do a limited query at least annually for every driver that you employ. And there's no date that it tells you of when to do this. You need to calendar this annually and make sure that you do it. So you're going to need to purchase a query plan because at least once a year, you need to do limited queries. Now, you only have to run a full query. Um, okay, if you, have a, if you know you have a known violation or you're doing pre-employment, that's a full query. If you run a limited query and you get a hit, which means there's negative information on a driver, then you need to convert that into a full query. The FMCSA Clearinghouse database is not going to double charge you if a limited query turns into a full query. Once you have your account set up, that will be considered the same search, okay? Um, you do need to request electronic consent from the driver for a full query if you've had a hit on a limited um, piece of data. Um, you can have that already in their file, but it has to be very specific. We're gonna talk about that, okay? Um, again, report drug and alcohol program violations that you're aware of. Um, record the negative return to duty test results and the date of successful completion of a follow-up testing plan for any driver that you employ with unresolved drug and alcohol program violations. Let's go to the next one. Okay, what's the difference between limited and full? I've talked about that a little bit, but limited query allows an employer to determine if someone has negative information, okay? Um, so it, it basically says there's something here um, that's resolved or unresolved, but it's not specific. It just tells you there's something there. And then um, that's a general driver consent. So you can have your drivers sign a consent, like I consent for 2020 uh, for limited queries but a, a limited query consent and a full query consent are two different things. And that's obtained by you, the employer, and or the um, TPA. Keep it in the driver um, uh, file that you have and, and make sure that you can find it and, and that you have that consent, okay? It has to be specific about the time frame. So you may need them to sign that every year. You can't just say it's for forever. That's not gonna work. It's gonna have to be for this quarter or you know, the year 2020, all right? A full query allows the employer to see detailed information about any violation, as we mentioned, and then the employer again must obtain the driver's electronic consent in the clearinghouse prior to the release of detailed violation information during the full query. This is one of the main reasons we're gonna circle back that you want people registered now because you don't wanna to try to be registering them once you have the violation already occurring. Now it's gonna take time. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is, this is why I say this, all right? So let's follow this chart. You run a limited query, you do an annual check, you're required to do the annual check or you've got a pre-employment, okay? Um, you have to have this consent outside the clearinghouse. Again, it may be electronic or wet signature um, and, it, and uh, it must specify a time range, okay? So when you have the consent responses and required actions, if the consent is refused by the driver to then do a full query, the full query cannot be conducted or if, if, they, even, if they refuse before you even get to the limited query. Uh, if they refuse, the driver's removed from safety sensitive functions, period, end of subject, okay? If the consent is provided, then um, you retain that uh, via either paper or electronically in the driver's qualification file. And remember, those files are separate from a normal standard employee file. They need to be separate and they need to be under lock and key. 
Um, so you get this limited query hit, you must request um, uh, the, the, well, you have the consent, you must request the full query. Okay, if there's no records found, um, there's no full query needed. If you do have records found, then you have to have the full, um, and you, again, you have to have consent, all right? But here's, look at the second bullet. If the full query is not conducted within 24 hours, the driver is removed from safety sensitive functions. <clears throat> All right, so folks, this part is so important. 24 hours to do that full query. If you don't have that driver already registered and you already don't have that consent on file, guess what? Federal motor carriers now will send a letter in the mail to the driver to get their consent for the full query. That's not gonna happen in 24 hours. So that driver has to stand down and be removed from safety sensitive duty. So you see, this is why I'm saying, get them registered, get them uploaded, get your consent, so that if and when there is a violation, you're not hung up on this 24 hour rule. You're able to move on, okay? All right, so now full queries, pre-employment checks um, on a prospective driver, or if a limited query returns a record. And then again, if you, um, you could do periodic checks. All right, um, so again, you need to have the consent um, again, if the consent's refused, <clears throat> they're removed from safety sensitive duty. And then if the consent is provided, um, then you look at the results for a full return to duty process, okay? If they have a violation with a negative return to duty, they haven't completed, they're removed. Um, but again, uh, if they've completed the return to duty action, uh, you know, no, you don't have to take action or that return to duty process. That's so, I, I, I'm just gonna park here for just like 30 seconds to advocate for drivers who have had a violation, but they have completed the process, give them a chance. Give them a chance um, to drive. Some, sometimes circumstances happen um, and you don't know what those circumstances are. We got to be careful not to judge. We got to keep people working. And one thing I always am going to advocate for is someone who has had a substance abuse problem or a screw up in their past, often that was their wake up call. And once they've completed this return to duty process with a substance abuse professional, these are your best employees. We have studies that show they're highly motivated. They can be your best drivers who show up and they, they don't want to go through that again. And so they're very motivated to do what they ought to do. So don't, don't let that um, discount someone from, from becoming your best employee. So that's my little, that's my little platform and we can go on to the next one. All right. This is a sample of a consent form. Um, there's a lot of great information in here. I would encourage our point to make this available to you. Maybe you've created one for your clients. Um, but there, this is a sample that FMCSA has on their website, and it says you're not required to use this form. It's merely a sample. You can put these elements in here or add other elements to it. But it basically remember that you have to have a um, timeline here. You can, it's not just for from now and forevermore. You've got to do this periodically. So you're going to have to have your drivers do this on a regular basis. But here's all the required information, company name, et cetera, et cetera. So um, follow that um, nice little template and do the consent form, whether electronically or hard copy. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so you can conduct queries on many drivers all at one time. Um, the way that you do that is create a nice little spreadsheet with the data in by the FMCSA format, which is, an, here's an example below, last name, first name, date of birth, CDL number, the um, country that this is in. Remember, Canada and Mexico border us. They are, um, they are mandated by the DOT rules. If they're crossing into U.S. territory, they qualify, all right? Um, the state, and then the query type in, in the database, all the query types are defined and listed. Um, so you can very clearly see and, and pick and choose and everything it has little questions um, like Q&A uh, next to it. So you, you can look that all up. 
just just remember, um, I actually wrote this down so that I say it to you um, in a way that, that would be helpful. If you are doing big batches, don't expect this to be instantaneous. Be patient, okay? Um, so you can you can dump in hundreds or thousands of these. You can even have different query types. Um, just be patient with the system. There could be delays. Um, so make sure that you know as you assign and you work, you need to go back for your results because it's not just going to all happen instantaneously. So um, so put it all in there exactly as you're supposed to, and then um, and then again remember. Um, in case I didn't already mention this, that whatever results you get, they need to go in the driver qualification file, okay? And again, under lock and key, and uh, that's all um, need to know only information for the, for the DER, um, but make sure that those results go in the file. Okay, let's go to the next one. I think we're getting close to Q&A here. Um, all right, so uh, for... Here is just um, conducting the query to, and sending the consent request. Um, if we have a violation and we don't have the consent, uh, this is the form that's going to go out from DOT and um, requesting the driver consent. I think there's a little bit of um, optimism about how well this will work right here because um, federal motor carriers feels very strongly that they simply need to just have this form emailed directly to the driver. The driver will click it and all will be well and we'll move forward. As you well know, drivers could be in a place where they don't have access to internet. They might not have a smart device on them to get an email. Um, you know, a lot of things could go wrong here that, that just it will not happen instantly. So this is where we come down to that 24 hour window. Um, so having the consent, having the registration, cannot stress it enough. Make sure you do that. Let's go on. All right, query bundle. Um, okay, so uh, $1.25 for a flat query rate, I would encourage you as an employer or owner-operator to um, purchase a plan. Um, there is an unlimited plan. It's, uh, I don't, it's a lot of money. It's like a what let's see i have it i have it written down here somewhere in my notes but i think it's um twenty four thousand dollars um unlimited it does expire um it 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 obviously lasts for a long time but but you've got to be an extremely large company to to need that plan so take a look at how many folks you have remember you're going to run an annual on everybody and then allow, you could look at your history and say, well, we have five violations a year or we have two violations a year. Maybe we have 10. Um, and those are going to require, a, you know, the next process. So just take a look and go in and purchase. Remember, you need to have that purchase for your TPA to go in and, and work on this. They can't do it for you. All right. So um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And, again, we have the website there for frequently asked questions. All right. Let's go to the next one. All right, um, recording data violations. Um, so look down here, alcohol violations are concentration of 0.04 or greater, uh, refusal to take an alcohol test, and then actual knowledge of an alcohol violation, which we have the same for the drug. Um, that is if, I mean, you have someone who says, yeah, I was, you know, drinking in my cab. I was sitting at the way station and I finished my beer and shoved it under the seat. Like it's actual knowledge that, or you, you as the supervisor, saw um, someone using. Uh, you're to report, you're to document. Um, so you can enter multiple violations. You enter one and then it'll give you the option to enter a second because sometimes these come in groups and it's not just one thing. So um, uh, make sure that, you know, if it's an alcohol and a drug violation, you're entering both. It's not okay just to put one... So it's not okay if you know there are multiple violations and you just go, I'm just going to click this one thing because I'm in a hurry and I'm going to move on. We need to tell the full story. We need to know what the full story is. The substance abuse provider, the MRO, everybody who's coming back into this system, they need to make sure that this person who has a violation gets the full 
scope of support and treatment that they need to make good decisions and be on the road safely. So please make sure that you pay attention to detail and, and you um, fill this out completely, okay? Um, so I do see one question, how will a CTPA know if a driver gets caught with an actual knowledge? Um, you're, this is uh, something like the CTPA, it's actual knowledge that you have. So it's, um, did they refuse the drug test? Did they c try to conceal with a cheap device? Something like that. Other than that, one of my last points that I'm going to make is communicate, communicate, communicate. CPAs and employers, uh, DERs, you guys need to have the kind of relationship where you can call each other and you can guide each other through this process and make sure that you have full information in the best interest of safety. Again, I, I just I want to stress, this isn't about punishing people. This isn't trying to keep people out of work. This is about safety and keeping people working. So let's make sure we all do the right thing and, and communicate well with one another. Let's go on to the next one. All right. Um, so I hope now that we can spend some time answering a multitude of questions. I'm hoping I answered a lot of these already. Um, but, John, let's open it up and tell me what we can talk about. Yeah, very good. Well, first off, I just posted info at arcpointlabs.com as an email address that if anybody has any questions, you can click on that. It's also up on the screen. Uh, so if you have any questions about anything that was covered that we don't cover in the remaining time, feel free to reach out to info at arcpointlabs.com. Additionally, we have several resources that are available as just value adds for you joining the call. If you have any interest in getting access to quick guides on how to register your employers, for, so your business, how to register as a CDL driver or uh, a resource to give to your drivers so they can register themselves, we have those available. Uh, you can email us at info at arcpointlabs.com and we'll get an industry expert to pass those over to you. We also have policy updates. So with this change cause it comes a need for you to update your drug and alcohol testing policy, add an addendum to that. We have that addendum available. Once again, that's something that we can provide. Uh, just as a thank you for you joining this call, uh, email us at info at arcpointlabs.com and we'll provide that. If you have a local rep and you already have uh, access to them, feel free to reach out to them. And then we also have other forms and just further information that we can provide. So we have confidentiality agreements. Uh, we have procedures for correcting database information, requests for DOT drug and alcohol testing info from the previous employer, those forms that are required, uh, the employer determined refusal form, driver consent for annual limited query forms, and refusal to test guidelines. So how to follow those procedures is available to you as well. So once again, all of that is available to anybody that's on this call at info at arcpointlabs.com. We'll get you in touch with a local industry expert. Our goal is to make this as easy as possible for you to navigate. We completely understand that Federal government's the federal government. They don't always make things easy. They don't always think about how it's going to affect uh, small business owners or even medium and large sized business owners. And so uh, while I think their, their website has been pretty well laid out uh, compared to other federal initiatives, I, I do think that, that they are struggling to keep up. And, and so we are here to try to help support that. And we're so thankful for organizations like Endasa that support us behind the scenes with some of these uh, initiatives and questions and changes that are coming. Uh, Joe, we do have several TPAs that are on the phone and, and questions that keep coming up revolving around whether or not they're registered as the primary TPA and what they have to do if they're not registered as the primary TPA. Several of our, our, our local uh, businesses that do collections won't actually own the account but will be a collection site for that account. Are there any specific mm -hmm. guidelines or rules that they should be following or thinking about, especially if they're not able to be the TPA uh, that, that is signed up? How should they be, be entering in information? And if they find errors, is that an error in the database, an error in the, in the program, or is that not something they should be responsible for? What do you think? Well, largely they're not responsible as the collector if they're not the TPA. There's not an avenue for them to log in. Um, but I think if you're providing third-party collections for the TPA, 
have a good relationship with them so that you can communicate with them when you have a known violation. Um, because, you know, when someone does a refusal to test and they walk out, we don't have paperwork all the time for that. Um, so you, you need to be able to, this, this is really going to generate and promote some good communication and conversation and some good systems and processes for doing so. Um, and, and if the TPA is non-responsive, I mean, hopefully that won't be an issue, but if the TPA is non-responsive to those concerns, let the employer know. The employer needs to know because at the end of the day, when it comes to 49 part 40, it's the employer who is responsible for these things and who faces the audit violations and the fines. So the employer needs to take that in hand and communicate with their TPA to say, we want open lines of communication so that we are using this database responsibly and, and respectfully and honoring the goal, which is safety. Awesome. We just launched a poll. Uh, so we can get feedback from everybody that attended. If you don't mind, take a couple minutes to, uh, to click through there and answer some of those questions for us. But let's go ahead, while we're waiting on people to do that, let's get to some of these questions. Uh, Wanda asked, is the report can be run to see which drivers have registered? You know, I am not sure of that. I think the basic way that you have to do that is run a query to see if they're in there. Um, you know, I, but, but I will say if you get in the database and, and you just search around and play with it, don't, you know, don't be afraid to go in and click around and, and learn what the database has to offer and see what is possible. Um, as John alluded to, but I'm going to just clarify something that cemented in my head a moment ago. Um, FMCSA has created this in a perfect world. But as you all know, we're all humans, and so the unexpected occurs in a variety of situations that happen on the ground. And um, if that is not something that you're finding available, go in and, and, again, let FMCSA know. But you should be able to, anybody who's registered in there, you should be able to search them. Um, if they're your employee, you can register them. If they're an owner-operator, they need to register themselves. Awesome. Let's see. Uh, once again, we have a poll up. If you don't mind taking a couple minutes to fill out some survey questions, that would be amazing. Give us feedback on ways that we can improve these webinars. Uh, looks like we have Ed. If a bottle is found during an, an observation, is that reported as actual knowledge or refusal to take the drug test? That's a refusal. That is a refusal. If And make sure that you go back and look at 49 Part 40. Um, uh, having a device and, you know, you need to know your process for confronting the donor with that device, and they have just uh, refused. Now, they can have the option to do a direct observe test, um, you know, and, and go ahead and follow through the process. But um, if they admit that they brought that device in and were prepared to teach, teach that test, that is technically a refusal to test. Very good. Rihanna asked, do we do owner operators have to do a query on themselves? Um, no, they do not. No, this is just for the employers who employ them. Cool. All right, and then it looks like there was some clarity around uh, a DUI question in a personal vehicle. Um, but Joe, do you want to cover if somebody gets a DUI in a personal vehicle, how does that affect their query? It, uh, from my understanding, this um, largely depends on the state and the class of CDL they have. I know there are some states that um, that immediately goes on their driver report and it will show up in a query. Um, I am not clear on how each state resolves that, um, whether they need to see a substance abuse professional and whether that affects their safety sensitive duties. I, and the reason I'm unclear on that, I've had two different answers. I've had absolutely they have to, and I've had that has nothing to do with their with their um, employee. I think that's a really good question for federal motor carriers, and since I'll be with those folks next week, I'm happy to nail that down. Uh, we're actually going to have just um, for Arc Point people who will be at our conference. There's going to be a FMCSA table staffed throughout the conference where we can ask these questions personally. So I would encourage. Um, 
us to get the answer to that question and see is that a federal thing or is it a state to state thing? Because it's a really good question to understand. And since I've had conflicting answers, let's uh, we'll take it up to FMCSA and we'll get some clarity on that for the next webinar. Yep. Very good. Well, I think there's a lot of more questions coming out. We're going to reach out to those people individually to see if uh, if they want some, some further answers. And then, like I said, lots of resources available to you if you're on this call. Email us at info at arcpointlabs.com. Just let us know that you attended the webinar. We'll get you a packet over, uh, and we'll get you in touch with a, a local industry expert. But, Joe, I can't thank you enough. I know that this is a busy week for you preparing for your big annual annual conference next week, but um, you've been a, a wealth of knowledge, a great support to us behind the scenes, both, you know, you, you support ArcPoint at our annual conference internally, as well as just uh, phone support and, and email support. So thank you. I can't thank you enough for, for doing this. Thank you. ArcPoint owners, Happy to help. if you have, yeah, awesome. ArcPoint owners, if you have questions that you want us to ask while we're live uh, at the NDASA conference, definitely uh, email those over to Ashley and John Bishop, and we'll make sure that we get those covered for you and get those questions, responses back out to you. And if you're an owner operator, an employer, or somebody that, that needs additional support in DOT services, once again, info at arcpointlabs.com. Thanks for joining. Joe, thanks again, and you guys have a great rest of your week. Take care. Thank you.